Those of you who have been following this channel for a while will know that we weren't exactly blown away by AMD's RX Vega cards. In fact, after we sold our RX Vega 56 and 64, we held a celebration the likes of which no other tech tuber has ever seen and will never see again. Actually, we bought a new camera with the money, but seriously though, the Vega cards were hot messes that didn't perform anywhere close to as well as many of us were hoping for gaming and were just generally dis extremely disappointing cards regardless of how many comments tell me I should lower my expectations of them and love them for who they are because don't we know that AMD tried their best and gay and thanks to one of their few saving graces their impressive mining performance they were also extremely hard to find not uh, not only just bad at gaming they're hard to find and stupendously expensive and if you're one of the few who didn't care about any of that another major issue was the complete lack of custom cards coming out of your favorite manufacturers. It took about six months before any third-party versions of the cards with superior cooling first started hitting the market. Come on, AMD! But hey, at least custom cards did come out eventually, and even taking RX Vega's many faults into account, they're still more than capable gaming and mining cards. In fact, barring its price at the time, the Vega 56 proved especially capable. So when Wootware gave us the opportunity to review XFX's custom Vega 56 double edition, we jumped at the chance. The double edition, which shouldn't be confused with XFX's first Vega 56, the boring reference model, is the company's first truly custom Vega 56, meaning a vastly different look and hopefully much improved cooling performance at an around 11,400 99 rand or $880 price tag. On the technical side of things, there's literally no difference between the reference model 56s and XFX's double edition. Unlike ASUS's ROG Strix Vega 56 Gaming OC or Sapphire's Nitro 56s, XFX's custom card doesn't feature bumps in base or boost core clock frequencies. You're getting the base Vega 56 in almost every way possible when it comes to what's inside. However, it's the outside where things start to get interesting. Looking past the card's aesthetic design, which we'll crap on, I mean, discuss in a second, the card's PCB is surprisingly where it differs from most other Vega 56 models. Where the PCB on cards like the aforementioned ROG Strix and Nitro cards run on almost the entire length of the cards, the PCB on the double edition stops about halfway through, with the rest of the space being taken up by the card's cooling solution and shroud. It's a strange decision by XFX, but one that became slightly less strange when we looked into it. According to various outlets, Vega cards don't require require a full length PCB with everything needed for the card to work, fitting snugly in about half as much space. But since the cards run really hot, they require full length coolers. So instead of cutting the PCB in half and just letting the shroud and cooler occupy the entirety of the leftover space, AMD decided to use a full length PCB in the reference designs, primarily to simplify auxiliary PCI Express power cable management for end users. Which basically means AMD didn't want users having to connect the power cables to the center of their cards because that would be weird. Well, XFX has been known to embrace the weird on occasion, and they certainly did so with the double edition, leaving half the PCB intact and plopping down the power connectors in the middle of the card. The card's other main difference is also its primary selling point, its double dissipation cooling system. It features dual 90 millimeter fans that are optimized to lower the overall noise levels without sacrificing cooling efficiency and a unibody heatsink which XFX claims enhances thermal efficiency by 40%. But before we test that claim, let's discuss the elephant in the room. Is there an elephant in here? I don't think there's an elephant in here. Anyways, the elephant in the XFX's room. XFX's double edition RX Vega 56 is the big old uggo. And if you think otherwise, well, you're allowed to be wrong. Now, before I dive into it, I want to express that XFX has a soft spot in my heart. They were the manufacturer of my very first graphics card, the XFX 8600 GT, which I got at CompUSA back in my high school days. I have a warm place in my heart for XFX, but this is probably one of the ugliest cards I've ever worked with. My disdain is almost entirely due to the fact that the card looks like it spent decades wearing a corset that slightly tightened around it, crushing all of its important bits so much that everything just kind of 
shot out of the sides. The poor thing looks like it was tortured. The reason XFX decided to go for this design is obvious though. As we discussed earlier, since they couldn't place the PCI Express connectors at the end of the card because they went with the shrunken PCB, they had to put them in the center. And since they couldn't exactly fit a regular shroud over said connectors, they decided to design a shroud that leaves room for them and did the same on the other end because why the heck not? But just because it had to be done doesn't mean I have to like it. And while we're on the topic of things I don't like about the design, I'm also not a fan of the bland red fans, the carbon fiber inspired finish because it's carbon fiber inspired, not actual carbon fiber, the single non RGB red LED lit XFX logo or the sharp cuts and edges of the shroud. It's just not my thing. It looks like XFX tried too hard and too little all at the same time and just no XFX, no. I understand where you're coming from. It kind of looks similar to your you know, your RX 580 model, but then at the same time, because you have to plug the power connector in the middle and you squeezed it even more, it just doesn't work. Whatever. These cards are for mining. Who cares what they look like? You just slot them in a thousand in a row and then you're good to go. Surprisingly though, I did actually really like one aspect of the card's aesthetic design, and that was the backplate and the side shroud directly connected to it. The backplate features a very understated XFX logo accompanied by a tasteful Vega decal, as well as various cutouts, holes, and light and dark finishes that really remind you that you're dealing with a premium product, even if the other side of the card screams otherwise, which to be fair, if you're putting this in a gaming system, the only thing you're gonna notice is like the fact that you have to stick the power connector in the middle you're not going to see the red fans or the carbon fiber inspired finish you're going to see the back plate which is good looking and then the side of it which is okay so you know depending on how you install it it couldn't be it doesn't have to be bad okay now of course looks are totally objective and some might really enjoy that card's design and that the whole shroud basically looks like an x for x effects but i just don't all of that aside though it's time to get to what's really important here performance more specifically we'll be looking into how the card performs in games just how much better x effects custom cooler really is and after that we'll take a look at mining performance so here are the results we got when using the card for what it was intended we ran all gaming bench marks at 1440p with quality settings set to their absolute maximum and without any anti-aliasing applied. The card performed about as well as expected at these settings with not a single game averaging below 30 FPS, including more graphics intense games like Deus Ex Mankind Divided and more recently Assassin's Creed Origins. It also made mincemeat of the likes of Metro Last Light, Metal Earth Shadow of War, and Rise of the Tomb Raider averaging 59 FPS or above in those games. Now while everything seemed in order here, we had a sneaking suspicion that something wasn't exactly right. So even though we hadn't originally planned to compare the card's benchmarks with a reference model we tested all those months ago, because we don't have it in house to test again because we had to sell it to get the new camera. We used a different system back then as well with a different CPU and we changed up which games we benchmark now. We're glad we took a look at some numbers from the previous the card, previous card. That's what I'm trying to say. We originally tested the reference Vega 56 model at the exact same 1440p resolution with the exact same quality settings but we actually turn on anti-aliasing instead of turning it off completely like we did with this time. This would surely mean that the reference card would return worse results than the XFX model almost unanimously, only that's not what we found. In fact, even with the extra strain being put on the reference card by the anti-aliasing, it scored noticeably better than the XFX card in more than a few games. In Ashes of the Singularity, the reference card pumped out about three additional FPS. In Hitman, the number jumps to almost eight FPS. In Shadow of War, there was a 6 FPS difference, and in 3D Mark's Time Spy GPU score, there was an equally worrying disparity. The reference model's victory in a few of the other games was a little less pronounced, and the XFX card did perform much better than the reference card in the Deus Ex benchmark, but still, there's little reason why the XFX card shouldn't wipe the floor with the reference model we tested so long ago. Drivers mature and improve after all, so what gives? Now, while it's highly unlikely considering the massive differences between the testing environments for both cards, we tentatively suspect that AMD hogged the highest bin Vega chips and stuffed them into their own reference designs. We've heard rumors as to this before, but until we can get to the, the exact same two cards in the room, we can't really speculate about that too much. All we know is that we saw slower clocks 
and worse performance. Anyways, let's move on to mining performance since that's what you'll probably be doing with this card when you're not gaming. You think we don't know, but we know. Now we have a ton of experience when it comes to mining with Vega. We even made a video entirely dedicated to it, so we mostly know what we're doing with XFX's Vega 56. First, we decided to run the card without any funny business going on. Mining with Ethereum, Crypto Knight, and just for funsies, the EchoHash algorithms. While mining Ethereum, the card managed a pretty good hash rate of 34.6 mega hash per second. Mining on the ever popular crypto night algorithm and maxed out at 1.032 kilohash per second and on the equihash algorithm which is really better suited for nvidia cards it pushed out 410 souls per second those are okay numbers for a bone stock vega card but that's kitty stuff we know how to get the most out of a vega 56 so let's Stop playing around here. The first thing we need to do is kick the original Vega 56 BIOS to the curb and swap it out with a fresh new Vega 64 BIOS to unlock higher overclocking settings because we're all about voiding warranties like that. And crashed. And crashed again. Maybe we'll try a different BIO and crash. Hmm, what about this BIOS crash? What the flippin' fudge? Eventually, we did successfully flash a Vega 64 BIOS onto the card, but when used as the primary GPU, we couldn't get it to boot into Windows, something we never really had an issue with when working with the reference card. Luckily, when slotted into the second PCI Express slot in the motherboard, the XFX 56 flashed with the 64 BIOS worked like a charm and we saw significant hash rate gains in each algorithm we tested. Ethereum shot up to an impressive 37.2 mega hash per second. Crypto Knight saw a slightly lower bump only reaching 1.125 kilohash per second and Equihash topped out at 472.4 souls per second. But of course that still wasn't enough to draw out the card's true mining prowess. In order to do that we also need to overclock it to its limits and optimize it for true unbeatable efficiency. This means underclocking the card's core clock to 1102 megahertz accompanied by by an undervolt of around 900 millivolts, overclocking the memory to 1100 megahertz, also accompanied by an undervolt of around 900 millivolts. And then all that's left to do is set a more aggressive fan curve and voila, more crashing goodness followed by even more crashing. So those are pretty intensive optimizations, but the reference 56 didn't have too much trouble staying up and running at those specific settings and managed an Ethereum hash rate of around 41 to 43 megahash per second. But whatever, dropping memory clocks little isn't a major train crash so that's what we had to do again and again and again until we eventually settled on a setting that didn't instantly kill the card that being 1020 megahertz on the memory unfortunately that setting resulted in noticeably less impressive hash rates than we would have liked to see on ethereum the double edition managed to squeeze out an additional few mega hash topping out at around 39.8 mega hash per second on the other two algorithms we tested we saw similar small but worthwhile improvements with crypto night maxing out just shy of 1.3 kilohash per second and Equihash topping out at 513 souls per second. And while we weren't bothered with testing the Equihash algorithm back after when we reviewed the reference Vega 56, we did test Crypto Knight algorithm and managed to actually break the two kilohash barrier on occasion. But for whatever reason, that seemed an impossible dream for the XFX's card. Okay, so the results for the XFX Vega 56 double edition have been a little bleak so far and as we've repeatedly mentioned that could be due to various factors including the most likely case that we were just unlucky in the silicon lottery but it's about time we talked about an area where this particular vega 56 should shine the brightest it's cool and unsurprisingly it shines brighter than my uncle's bald forehead after a good polish okay maybe not that bright but still at idle in a particularly sweaty office the double edition card really got hotter than 32 degrees celsius which is six degrees cooler than what we saw with the reference model so we expected maybe a three to four degree difference there so it's already proving to be more capable than we thought next up we recorded the average maximum temperature of the card after multiple gaming sessions and we were even more impressed with the xfx's cooling system which only let the card hit a maximum temperature of 67 degrees compared to the reference designs concerning 74 degrees and while we didn't record mining temperatures during our reference vega 56 review we did with the double edition which maxed out in a manageable 72 degrees at a 60 percent fan speed 60 percent not 60 percent as impressive as the results are they're not exactly unexpected reference blower style coolers just can't hope to match the cool 
cooling performance of the third party designs. Sorry guys, the light turned off, nothing I can do, my bad. The double edition's much improved heatsink, additional super speedy fan, and better VRM and memory cooling capabilities completely wipes the floor with the reference design. And it also does it at a far more manageable noise level, where the reference design sounded like a jet taking off whenever it went above 70% speed, the double edition's fan only really became unbearable to listen to when it hit around 90% utilization. Luckily, because of the card's phenomenal cooling, we can't recall it needing to go that high more than once in our many days of testing, no matter how hot it got in the office with mining and all that such. This card was a hard one to review, though. We worked with XFX cards in the past, and they've more often than not blown us away in terms of performance. I mean, we even crowned the XFX ARX 580 Black Edition the best gaming and mining 580 on the market. We know they produce quality cards that go head to head with any other in their category, but that wasn't the case with what we found with this particular card. We can overlook a shroud design that's not exactly to our liking, and we can overlook various other flaws but we can't overlook the numbers. And unfortunately, the numbers aren't what we expect of an XFX card. Overall, it performed worse than the reference model in both gaming and mining performance during our testing. One affected by the system difference, the other not so much. Doesn't matter what you're running with mining if it's not getting the same performance. And though we've said it before, We'll say it again, this could be up to various factors, including getting a lesser bin chip, but we can only report what we saw. That being said though, the performance gap between the two is small enough not to throw XFX's card out of the race. Its spectacular cooling performance across the board alone keeps it in the running if that's something that's important to you as well as it should be. So if you can find one at a reasonable price, which is the difficulty with Vega 56s at this point, I mean, Wootware has this one going for 11,499 Rand, a GTX 1080 is going for 12,499 Rand, but Wootware has the Palette 1070 Ti going for just under 10,000 Rand, which the 1070 Ti is a much better gaming card. So if you're looking for gaming, get that Palette 1070 Ti from them. But for mining, obviously the optimizations that you can make for Vega 56, that's where the higher price comes in and then so on and so forth. So it's up to you, but it could be the perfect addition to your gaming rig. But for the mining side of it, it's hard to recommend because we just weren't able to squeeze out of it everything we could with a reference 56. When we could get 1.8 to 1.9 kilohash on a reference on a bad day, but only pump out 1.3 on the XFX because we can mod the bio, we can't mod the BIOS as well. It seems like a worse card. This could be just because we couldn't find the right Vega 64 BIOS to put on the card. And there might be one out there that'll unlock the mythical Crypto Knight performance performance, but we only found bugs and hardship, which I guess is good news for gamers, I suppose. If the aftermarket cards are having a harder time being modded for mining and require more work and input, they're less likely to be gobbled up by the masses and could be left on the shelves. Meaning we could finally see Vega cards start selling for less. And by less, I mean they'll come down from their Super Saiyan God, Super Saiyan premiums and just be at an uncomfortable price hike like their un NVIDIA counterparts. But none of this is to say that the XFX Vega 56 isn't worth buying, just that it's a bit more of a fight to get it to where you want it to go. Performance might be a little lower, but noise and temperatures are phenomenally improved to make it a great choice over reference if you're looking to mostly game. Which I'd like to thank Wootware for sending the XFX Vega 56 over for us to review. Wootware, in case you didn't know because you're new to the channel, is an amazeball South African computer e-tailer. They have a phenomenal selection on everything from GPUs, including this Vega 56, to Fantex cases, to every other part you could possibly want. Their prices are insanely competitive and their customer service seals the deal with it rivaling the best in the world. So if you're in South Africa, head on over to wootware.co.za to woot up your PC. Their link will be in the video description. But what do you all think of this Vega 56 from XFX? Do you like the design? Are you keen on having that core set look? Have you had an after model Vega 56 yourself and run into any of the same issues that we have? Let me know either down in the comments or over on Twitter. I am at UF Disciple. If you're not in South Africa and you're looking to pick up a new car for your gaming or mining rig, you can use our Amazon affiliate code that's also in the description to help support us here at the channel. You smash that like button if you enjoyed this review and get subscribed so you can stay up to date on all of our tech related content. Anyways, I'm Brett with the UFD Tech Channel. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video. Cheers. Yes, closet, next few videos, just deal with it. Lights going off, there's, I'm on the road! And everything's so hard. Like, it, I have, I have, I have, I have very limited recording conditions and it makes it frustrating. Because um, my kids are literally sleeping beyond this door.
So I'm recording at 9.30 at night when my kids are supposed to be sleeping, yelling at a camera in a closet because life. That's just, that's just where we're at. So thank you guys so much for sticking with me during this crazy portion of everything. I hope y'all enjoyed this video. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop rambling. Love you guys.